What is up, wrestling fans? Welcome to another pay-per-view point edition of the Smart Out Moment Smack Talk Podcast. I'm your host as always, Tony Mango, and joining me as always are Callum Wiggins. Hello. And Robert D. Felice. Hey, hey. Hey, 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 everybody. It is 12, 12 in the morning right now. We are going to talk about the Fight for the Fallen event that just happened. And then afterward, we got to do all the Evolve stuff and stuff. We're not going to do a post for that one. Not quite the same. That's going to be on the hot tag. So if you're wondering where that is, wait a little bit. Be a little patient. But we will be breaking down AEW's third event you know, kind of quicker pace than we normally do because we have that stuff to get and kind of get around to. So uh, forgive us for kind of blowing through some things, but we're still going to talk about all the matches that happen and everything else that we kind of have to chime in about. And we invite you to do the same thing in the comments section below. So go ahead and do that. And while you are there on YouTube, hit that bell and subscribe for notifications, because that is when you'll be aware of these next couple of videos and stuff that are going to be coming your way. Really quickly, just to get the plugs out of the way, very uh, quickly up front, you should be following us on Facebook and Twitter at Smart Out Moment. You should be hitting up that Patreon and buying some stuff on TeePublic, on uh, Redbubble as well, if you want to throw some spare change our way and keep us going and motivate us to keep doing these kind of things. And you should check out fanboysanonymous.com. You should check out all the things that are happening on that side of things, Facebook, Twitter, YouTube, etc., if you are on the audio only platforms, then you can't leave a comment there because that's not how that works. But you could go to smartcatmoment.com and leave a comment on any of the pages there about your thoughts on this event. So keep all that in mind, everybody. And we will uh, round things out, I guess, a little bit more a little bit later on. But also, very quickly, follow these guys on their Twitter accounts it's in the descriptions below. Dude Felice, Wigmeister14. Follow me at Tony Mango. All right, out of the way. Now let's get into Fight for the Fallen. We had nine matches on the card and a promo. And one of the main things that we had that we were feeling was the takeaway for this was it felt like it was really, really long. And I'm looking right now at the match times, and they weren't really particularly long. 13 minutes, 11 minutes, 15 minutes, 19 minutes, etc. But it felt like it was long. No, that that is a long show. It's, it's not so much the fact that you have... All those matches, because on in their own way, they're not particularly long. But when you just add them all together, accumulatively, they're all too long. You should you should typically have only. I'm just going by the the two recent New Japan shows that just happened. They had, I think it was about four shows, the four four matches, should I say, that went over 15 minutes long. And just the other matches, like the opening tag team matches, are more like somewhere between five and ten minutes so they're more short snappy taster affairs whereas this one is just long match followed by long match followed by long match followed by long match it's just i don't know where it's arrogance or whether it's just naivety that fans can stay have their attention spans as long for these type of matches but yeah it, it, the show was over four hours long and it felt every single second of it yeah i feel like a lot of people complain when something like wrestlemania goes on forever and if you don't apply the same logic to certain things, then you're being a hypocrite. And I'm going to get to that in a little bit when a couple other things happen later on. I will say I enjoyed a good amount of this. I think that overall I might like this better than Fighter Fest. It kind of depends. But some matches I didn't quite like as much as some of the matches at Fighter Fest. It was... You know, it's kind of a give and take. Like, if you mixed the good elements of Fighter Fest and Fight for the Fallen together, then I think it would be one really good event. And now it's sort of like two B minuses, sort of. I guess. You know what I mean? How you feeling about think, it, Rob? I think Fighter Fest had more variety. If I'm being honest, this yeah was a real case of great wrestling matches on repeat and little to no story which as we get into it we'll talk about why chris jericho stood out so much i think if the show was an hour sure it would have been received a lot better 100 yeah. percent. i think two if you matches would, off, yeah. i was just gonna say if you cut off two matches then it was exactly the same thing if you cut out two of the matches and you know one of the biggest uh complaints about wrestlemania was the main event started at 12 o'clock in the same vein, a regular pay-per-view's main event should not start at 11. Or if it is, it shouldn't be, what was it, like, 40 minutes long? 31.25, it says on Wikipedia. Hmm. 
Well, first things first, I want to ask you guys, what did you think about the stage and the set? Because this is not meant to be an arena that's like a normal thing. It's a music venue. I really liked it. I thought it, it felt very different to how a traditional wrestling venue should look. And I think that's a good thing every now and again. I'm not saying that every single show should be held in a venue like this, but having like the staging area to one side of it and having this big wall of fans to the outside of it, I thought that actually was a pretty cool visual, especially the way they filmed it in certain aspects of it. I agree. I think the variety in staging is one of the things I've grown to really like about this promotion, that attention to detail in every event feels different yet special they're a big fan of that chandelier though third time in a row they've used that chandelier they should have started chanting for it she could have got it over <laughs> might know. chandelier chandelier and imagine if suddenly... it had fallen and pinned someone oh then it would have been a five-star classic <laughs> <laughs> the chandelier is the new 24 7 champion I liked the stage to a certain extent. Um, I'm sure if I were there, I probably would have more issues with it, especially because of like, it being outside with the heat and all that. It probably would have bugged me. But it looked different. It looked interesting. I was cool with that. I started getting distracted towards the end of it because I just was looking at fans fanning each other. I just holding the uh, programs, I assume, and just like waving them down because I imagine it was really, really hot there. Probably a little musky in that arena. Yeah. Overall spectrum kind of notes, one thing that we need to talk about is the commentary team. Every time that they cut to those three, I felt like the energy just got completely zapped away. Like, whether it was Jim Ross talking or Alex, uh, was it Marvez? Is that his name? Marvez, yeah. Or Excalibur. They didn't seem like they really cared about anything. Like Everything was very, like... And then we've got a match coming up, and it's going to be, you know, this, and uh, are we going to the main event? Yeah, I think that's what we're doing. Okay. Yeah, I was All like, right. oh, my God. Can you guys, like, act like you're fucking excited or something? You so, know, like I'm going to place about 80% of the blame on Jim Ross. Now, Jim Ross obviously is a legend, and he's somebody that we all – love and respect and i've heard a lot of complaints about his commentary in recent years tonight it really really fucked with me he came across as super like an ornery old man like he was just super irritated uh especially with alex marvez like as if they had had some friction about how alex had been calling the shows and one thing that did not work was Jim Ross trying so hard to throw in old school rules and ideas in the modern style, specifically in the main event, when it all broke down for several minutes and everybody was just in the ring, as is typical in a PWG match, which Excalibur might be used to calling. Jim Ross is just like, and this is illegal, and why why is this even happening? I felt bad because it's so clear that he's not cut out for this. And maybe they wanted the voice of wrestling. Maybe they wanted the greatest commentator of all time, but he's not cut out for this style of wrestling. It just doesn't fit. And man, he came across so just annoying tonight. And I hate that, but it's true. Do you feel the same about that, Callum? Was the commentary bothering you? I will, I will say that it definitely was unenthusiastic, and that may be due to the heat. It also will be due to the fact that Jim Ross is 67 years old now. He's definitely not in the prime of his career at this point in time. I will still, and I will constantly stand by this, I would take Jim Ross at 67 over any of the WWE announced team because I would rather somebody who is like losing it a bit and is a bit out of touch to someone who is either being forced buzzwords down and is not really paying attention to anything, he's just reading from a script like Michael Cole, or someone who has absolutely no idea what they're talking about, like Renee Young. And so I, I, I'll at least take that aspect of it, but commentary was bad, and that is due to the fact that, like you say, Jim Ross was unenthusiastic, did it come across as quite grumpy and trying to put in a story where, it, frankly, for most of the matches, there was no story. And then the fact that Alex Marvez just isn't good at his job, full stop, and I'm st- starting to think he never will be. 
Yeah, I think they're still going through growing pains. And I genuinely feel like if you cut down the third man and you leave it at JR and Excalibur, they can form a bond and create a good team. But I think I'd like to see Alex Marvez hit the road. Hmm. I did like the beginning of this quite a bit. This started off with something that was completely opposite of what we've had for Fighter Fest. Fighter Fest had a thing very early on with the librarians that did not go over well. And this started off with Peter Avalon coming out with Leva Bates. And they kept it very short. And then they went into Sunny Kiss coming out with the cheerleaders, which I have a note to myself that says cheerleaders are hotter than the Fighter Fest girls. Because <laughs> that no, was true. Uh, I liked his entrance. I liked Sunny Kiss's performance overall. I the split on the ropes during the entrance, I felt it was really crazy too, and his finisher was interesting. And it was like five minutes long. I liked it. It was just quick. Get out there, do some stuff. It's not completely over the top. It's a little bit silly, but not to like a degrading type of level. And this was actually one of my like more enthusiastic parts of the night, oddly enough. I thought they showcased Sunny Kiss perfectly. I understand, by the way, you're talking that this is your first time seeing Sunny Kiss. And yeah, the cheerleader entrance was perfect. Cool to get the Jacksonville Jaguar cheerleaders. I know you had to love the name of the Jacksonville Jaguar Jackson Deville, which I just, that to me had me laughing for the entire buy-in. And yeah, the librarian thing is stupid, but they know that. So what are you going to do? They they kept the librarian thing restrained this time, which I guess the benefit of like pushing it into the ground in your first two shows is now you can have it a bit more restrained and cut short and people are still going to boo the shit out of it because you've already made them hate it in the first two shows, which if they continue to do it like that and they just do it in small bursts, I'm totally fine with it, especially because Peter Avalon seems like he know seems like he's a far better wrestler than Lever Bates is based on this performance alone. And Sonny Kiss, I'm a huge fan of his like flamboyance, his charisma. He seems like he's having fun in the ring at all times, which is great. I just wish that what he was doing looked like it hurt people. Yeah, because he it. he because he just comes across as a guy playing wrestler, as opposed to an actual wrestler. There was a moment in this match, I believe it was, following a suplex into a cover where I had the same feeling as Callum said that it looked like somebody just playing wrestler, which may improve over time through prolonged exposure on TV, but. Yeah, I did have that feeling. That being said, still love Sunny Kiss as a character. Mm -hmm. Great segment and a highlight of the buy-in. Yeah, because then we went into the Britt Baker and Rio against B Priestley and Shoko Nakajima match. And that one, I hate having to crap on uh, the same kind of things all over again and all that. I don't hate this match, but there were lots of weak points in there and particularly Nakajima was the one that stood out to me as her punches just awful I and mean, she barely putting any kind of thing behind it it was like you might as well just be like booping her nose you know and just slow kind of things like that just don't go off well to me I don't know if like they're the matches are going on too long and they're running out of steam and that's hurting things but so this is happening a lot with these types of matches, and it's really starting to bug me because it's like, they're tag team matches. You shouldn't have any excuse for being exhausted. And if you're that exhausted, I don't know what to do, you know? But this started out okay, and then it started to get a little bit annoying because of things like that, because I, you know, there's only a certain amount of elbows to the face that I could take before I'm like, can you kind of do something else? Can you maybe, like, punch each other instead of just doing elbows all the time? It's something that I'm noticing a lot about the women's division. Lots of elbows. And uh, forearms and everything. And uh, then the big highlight slash low point of this, the closed captioning pops up. <laughs> and it's not even good closed captioning. It's got these massive mistakes on it. Like somebody was just mashing a keyboard. It's like L equals nine semicolon B apostrophe capital G. 
it, at one point I noticed that it said A K N E E, like acne or something. And it's just like this. If this would have popped up for two seconds, it still would have been a problem because it shows that there's some kind of an issue backstage. But this went on for midway through the match, all the way into the end of that, into the next promo segment. I had forgotten about this until you just brought it up, and Twitter was a riot. The entire, everything that AEW tweeted was met with Twitter versus the closed casting. They called fucking closed casting. Uh, What is this? I'm not excited for this subtitle match. (laughs) And like Tony said, there was just gibberish. Like, just random symbols almost to the point where it would have looked like hieroglyphics. Mm-hmm. Uh, and the response from Matt Jackson, when they finally shut it off, two minutes later, he just tweeted, Shh. like, we heard you. Thank you. We're sorry. Shut up. <laughs> if you argue on two sides of this, number one, or number one, it's not a numbered thing. On the left side, on the positive side, it's their third show. WWE still makes mistakes. Okay. However, on the flip side of things, why are you still having these kind of production issues? Shouldn't you have figured this out well in advance? Well, I think it's at least the refresher fee is it's different production issues. <laughs> like, <laughs> like every week, it's a, every every show, it's a different production issue. So you just you fix that one, another one pops up. As long as it's not the same one twice, then I guess you're kind of yeah. on the right way. Because, again, to be perfectly honest, if we're going to, like, equate this to WWE-type stuff, you know, what happened with the Usos coming out on the Superstar Shake-Up? It was like, we have the Usos name pop up, and, oh, my God, we got this team coming out in about, like, two minutes and whatever. Things happen. WWE has done plenty of mistakes, plenty of times. This is only their third show. But it still doesn't make it good, you know? Two wrongs don't make a right. Yeah. In terms of the actual match... um. It's just it's it went on twice as long as it should have gone, mm-hmm. which I think was the biggest thing that hurt. I think you would have been able to bypass some of the the botches and the weak spots just because of just how just how long it was going and how much it dragged on. The fact that you have to go through two hot tag spots, you don't need to do that for this type of match. This was meant to, this should have just been an introduction into B Priestley and Nakajima, really, because we'd seen the other two compete before. We no, kind of have an idea about what they're about. More of a showcase for B Priestley because she should be a big deal for this promotion. Uh, apart from that, I mean, you talk about the striking thing. The worst thing that I could have done before going into this match is watch New Japan. Because like, you watch the striking between Nakajima and Riho, and then you, I'm in my mind picturing... Well, I saw Jeff Cobb versus Tomohiro Ishii like a couple of hours ago, <laughs> and it's like they're they're throwing haymakers that would knock any man, woman or child out for like a light in one hit, and these guys are like hitting each other with like those little slap fights that you'd have as like on, in slumber parties or stuff like that. <laughs> it's just yeah, it's just a whole, whole complete disconnect. And there was some good stuff. There was some good stuff in these this match so i don't want again don't want to go all about it i just think he would again like the theme throughout the entire show it'd be much better received if it was seven minutes shorter and for anybody the striking issue was a problem throughout the night i think there's a lot of these drawn out spots of uh it's got to be a big striking battle because it's got to be fighting spirit but in america i don't know i just huge disconnect for me not just in this match but throughout the night well in particular for this with what bothers me is just the forearms because it's like all right so you can't punch each other in the face you're just going to do forearm and forearm sh- and forearm you shouldn't technically be punching people in the face though because again i know we could talk about the hell the rules don't follow or anything but punches are illegal you shouldn't that's be right and also and, and this is another horrible thing to say but most wrestlers nowadays don't know how to do a work punch they look terrible. And like I say, the forearms here looked terrible. But the yeah, forearms the forearms aren't any better. better. No, but yeah. But for most people, they can actually do forearms properly. But most people can't do a work punch anymore. Have you... Think about it. In the last, like, 20 years or so, who does a work punch better than The Rock? No one. Who comes close to doing a work punch like The Rock? No one. 
Like you probably say, oh, Dustin can do it, but Dustin's been working since the 80s. Of course, but Dustin knows how to do a work punch. They don't teach people how to do a work punch anymore. This is weird. I, I haven't thought about this, but what are Cena's work punches like? Terrible. His punches are awful. I don't and... see. I don't remember thinking of anybody in WWE's punches being awful, except for Shane McMahon and sometimes The Undertaker nowadays. Well, Shane McMahon's punches look awful because he actually hits people, and that's that's like as bad as it gets really. But just when you look at it, it just doesn't look like a real punch. And secondly, you shouldn't really be doing punches to the face because in a real fight situation, a punch is probably a, a punch when you the person is not blocking it is going to knock them out. A forearm, at least there's a little bit of room to maneuver because you're hitting them in the chest or in the neck area. You're not really hitting them in the face, maybe in the jaw occasionally, but it's supposed to rock them. You can't have a situation where people are doing like, I don't know, sequencing 10 punches together and then the big show hits one punch or Lacey Evans hits one punch and they're knocking people out. So, oh, I mean, I can buy that more with somebody like a big show, but not a Lacey Evans. <laughs> No, but it, it, and it's if they a, if that's like the only excuse to get around the forearm thing, the forearm still sucked anyway. So it's like you know what I mean. Oh yeah, I understand that, but it's just a case of I I think maybe you trade for chops then instead. You just trade it trade for something else. I just I personally I don't like seeing punches in wrestling matches unless it's used to like behind the referee's back as an actual right. as an actual heel tactic. And maybe that is too old school, school, but you know. Yeah, but I'm I'm with you, and you mentioned The Rock, and it seemed like back in those days, Austin Rock had it down to an art form, but yeah, you don't see good working punches anymore. So, yeah, I guess forearms are the better way to go. It just didn't land here. And I, I'll and maintain, and, and, I don't well, I, think of anybody's punches as being bad, so it's already a better option in my mind. I Like, I don't think that the Miz has a bad punch because I don't remember ever going uh, he's got bad punches you know never stood out to me at the very least I've always watched it and I've always thought his punches are terrible but he's a weak wrestler anyway so it doesn't really matter too much I'm not a weak wrestler in terms of like bad but he's weak in terms of he's not much of a striker I mean I, usually when I look at the Miz I go wow your kicks are terrible but your kick's supposed to be terrible because you're supposed to be mocking Daniel Bryan but that's besides the point but it's just the idea of I'm I'm all for like big forearm battles. As somebody who watches in Japan, I have to watch forearm battles all the time. And when they're done well, they're brilliant. But in this case, it was it was poor. And uh, for anybody who's wondering about the results, Sonny Kiss won the first match. B Priestley and Shoko Nakajima won the second match here. Uh, the next match was a six man tag, and MJF, Sean Spears, and Sammy Guevara get the win. One of the better matches of the night. This is where I wrote a note to myself that I noticed that everybody has generic rock music entrances, and I really don't like that because I can't even. I'm like I don't think that when this has a TV show coming out, I'm still gonna be able to tell who's coming out at any point because it's all just sort of generic, and kind of want them to change that up a little bit. But I like uh, that Spears is going by the chairman. That's funny, and. That he's got the perfection with the 10 in there. That's funny, too. He looked like he was towering over everybody in this match, which is kind of interesting. And I overall, I liked it. This is one of my more favorite matches of the night. Yeah, I thought this was... um, It was it was definitely a good match. I like the fact, as they should have done, they played off the story with the MJF and Sean Spears hating each other. There was a lot of um, fi- middle finger gesturing in this match. Between like from Jimmy Havoc to Joe Janela, MJF and Sean Spears and Sammy Guevara basically all just giving each other flipping each other the bird on a regular basis. Uh it was a good showcase for Sammy Guevara because he did a lot of good work in this match to try and compensate for the fact that Sean Spears was being a bit of a cowardly person, not performing when unless he was on the advantage and MJF was just being very cocky as he always is doing a move and then just preening about it for 10 minutes and then moving on to the next one. Uh, I'm surprised about the fact that, well, first of all, that the heels won because I was expecting the baby face to win because Spears and MJF wouldn't be able to get on the same page and they didn't, but they still managed to win anyway. And the fact that it was Sean Spears pinning Darby Allen, because it kind of feels like, well, you protected Darby Allen in that 20 minutes to draw his Cody Rhodes so he could lose to in a six-man tag to Sean Spears. 
then you could isn't that what Jimmy Havoc's there for? But overall it was a good match. So in regards to the finish, I feel like the main reason that happened is so that Sean Spears could say, Hey Cody, you didn't beat him, but I did. So that's the takeaway that I got from that. I was very surprised that they didn't play more into MJF and Sean Spears not getting along. It seemed like a written story, and they just chose to go the other way with it. Because here's another problem AEW has. Saw it all night long. They are so worried about trying to convince everybody that they have the best wrestlers and everybody on the roster is so good that again these matches can have weird finishes or get drawn out for way too long as we're going to talk about soon because they're like oh but everybody's got to shine everybody's got to look good and sometimes even when you're building or especially when you're building a new promotion not everybody has to look super duper strong yeah i agree yeah it but can be an issue darby allen had his chance to be like the high-flying energetic guy and mjf's already a star if you just give him a microphone spears looked good here guevara looked good here if anything havoc and janela were the two that fell short but that's fine because it shouldn't be six people looking great throughout a whole match you know I- that I thought Havoc and Janela did pretty well. I think the one that did the least was Sean Spears. Oh, yeah, he did. But I think that that was part of the gimmick of the whole thing. Oh, yeah, it's part of the gimmick. But he definitely didn't, like, he's, he wasn't out there to impress anyone. Which I guess is fine, because he's not supposed to do that, because he's the heel. They but should have thought... had him come out with a chair. Yeah, I don't know why they didn't. Seems kind of strange. Maybe they were worried about a backlash that, that would get. Hmm. Obviously, By the way... calling him the chairman is enough, but... This promotion likes blood. <laughs> I'm convinced of that. Oh, it's obvious. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, anything else to say about this one? No. Nah. No, nah, yeah. it was. It was. It was. I think it was one of the few matches that I thought went as long as it should have gone. Yeah, this was a thumbs up one for me. Thumbs down for the most part when it comes to Brandy Rhodes versus Allie. Brandy Rhodes is not a wrestler. You can tell. And here's where the other another hypocritical kind of thing comes in here. If you are not a fan of Stephanie McMahon playing the evil authority role and then wrestling every once in a while and not being able to put on a five-star match and all the other kind of things that go along with that, you can't say that you like Brandy Rhodes and not be a hypocrite because she is not – she's just not like a wrestler for the most part. You could tell all the moves that she had done that she was second-guessing herself and – running into situations being like, well, I don't know if this is really the might move to go or different things like that. And she's definitely playing the heel authority figure role because she's got awesome Kong by her side, helping her out. So it's the same exact thing. You can't hate one and like the other one without being a hypocrite. And the real big takeaway for this was they had Aja Kong come out and it's Aja Kong and awesome Kong Kong versus Kong. I'm so with that. We've never had that in America. That's going to be so much fun. This match was lame. Brandy Rhodes is super hot. <laughs> Allie is just okay as a wrestler and in terms of looks. The end. Uh, I think with the Brandy Rhodes thing, I'm, I'm not looking forward to another heel authority figure over the top of it. You have to think that at least a long term goal with the whatever they decide to build up the women's tournament, it's going to be Brandy Rhodes either pushing herself forward to try and win it or backing Awesome Kong to win it, and that's why she's got Awesome Kong as her enforcer. Uh, having Awesome Kong interfere and come out was a nice pop, but uh, you have the spots where Ali both should have pinned Brandy Rhodes and should have made her submit, so that kind of protects her. But then you had Brandy win because, of course, she did. If you're going to build up any sort of feud between these guys and bring Arsha Kong in to try and level the playing field with Austin Kong, then you have to give the heel the win on the first one. I kind of like the fact that because when I was when we were originally talking about like the match with the idea of 
Brandy Rhodes a heel, but a lot of the build up has been around her overcoming adversity and stuff along those lines. I kind of feel like it's subtle it's subtly genius because she's using that she's using the production value that she has and the power that she has in AEW to create video packages like that to try and make her seem sympathetic and then she comes out and she's an absolute bitch. And that's actually kind of genius in a way. But like like Tony Tony says, you can't hate Stephanie McMahon for doing a similar thing and like Brandy Rhodes for doing it. Because even though Brandy Rhodes is a slightly better wrestler and definitely has more reps under her belt, she's still not very good. And she does second guess herself on a lot of spots. And some of the stuff like a Fichita super kick in this match would look absolutely terrible. And Ali should be pushed really, really highly just because of her, like, her, her kind of like fire that she has in these matches. I wouldn't say that she's spectacular by any stretch of the imagination, but I think she has a pull with the crowd that a lot of other people won't be able to get. So I think there's still a lot of room for her to grow in this promotion. So, also, for that matter, the people that think that Stephanie shouldn't be a heel then turn around and be all like rah rah women's revolution yep. type stuff. Brandy, yeah. Brandy does the same thing. It's I'm, I'm a heel. Also, here's the charity check, and you know. Same exact and thing. That is one issue I really have with this company. I know that they had detailed that they were going to be like this, but it's annoying to watch the fact that everybody switches alignment in terms of context. Like one minute the young books are uber baby faces, and the next minute they are the biggest dicks in the industry. And same thing with Brandy Rhodes here. I just that's a personal thing. I don't like the way they handle heel and face alignment i'll get used to it or get over it or whatever yeah then we had another one of the matches that i think was actually i'll, I'll go ahead and say this this match uh between the dark order and helico and jack evans and jungle boy and luchasaurus was my favorite part of the night oh i i, I love this match this was fun as 100%. all hell i'm glad that everybody agrees on that one too because th this was and oddly enough, out of all the things, I was thinking that maybe they were building up the Dark Order as being like this big deal. And since I have never seen anything of them, that maybe they would be the standouts. It was Jungle Boy and Luchasaurus. Yeah, like, of course it is. Yeah. It was like, I, now I know Luchasaurus from a tiny, tiny, tiny little bit of NXT as Judas Devlin and primarily more for uh, Big Brother. So I'm used to just Austin from Big Brother. And Luchasaurus, I was like, all right, I made a joke on the Mega Maniacs. It was like, oh, Luchasaurus is like Kane, but not as talented and shorter and a joke and all this other kind of stuff. And like a minute later, he's doing these fucking flips and stuff. And I'm like, God damn, way to prove me wrong. Like, Bro, that I is awesome. Away. I walked away the biggest Luchasaurus fan. I mean, Jungle Boy is fantastic and it's awesome. Their whole package is awesome. But I was like, luchasaurus is fun and i want to see so much more of luchasaurus and yeah they're probably my favorite team right now i'm not impressed with the dark order i'm a little mad when it comes to evans and angelico because just because they're just there like they weren't really doing anything special jungle boy held his own he did the he was the anchor for this match and luchasaurus was the high spot fun part like I wanted them to win so much. Yeah, yeah, they are they're a really fun unit that's been kind of just thrown together because of their separate gimmicks. But it just works with having this small, fiery, good looking baby face that the crowd absolutely have gone behind immediately. I'm sure there were many people that before AEW started didn't know who Jungle Boy is and now everyone is behind him almost instantaneously. And Luchasaurus is just so much fun to watch as this big guy who can move like a cruiserweight, do all this cool stuff, do all these cool kicks, do all these flips. And adding Marco Stunt to it as well as this really, really tiny guy that can do <laughs> a lot of really cool high-flying stuff. And I, I hope we didn't get to see it tonight, but if he starts flossing during a match and stuff like that, I'm sure people will get a pop out of that as well. That That trio is bizarre and interesting and so much fun to watch uh i think jack evans and helico were reined in 
a little bit for this match just because they wanted to highlight both uh, the the, the boy and his dinosaur and, yeah, and the Dark Order. So I think they were either asked to or at least like decided to rein it in a little bit by just not showcasing themselves enough. Because I would say like on Double or Nothing, one of the people that impressed me most on the entire show was Jack Evans. And he definitely wasn't at that level tonight, but I don't think they were supposed to be. Dark Order, they're a little just there. I, I like Stu Grayson. He looks like he's very well put together and he's got a, a variety of like offensive moves, but I, I don't really feel too much like a, a pull for him. It's just him doing moves. And Evil Uno... It's a bit like just this giant guy who was taking bumps way too much for someone his size. Because like he came in to the ring pretty early on against Jungle Boy and was taking bumps from drop kicks and stuff like that. And I was like, "You're like twice his size. Why are you taking bumps from drop kicks?" It's it's like a guy who knows that he's a lot bigger and feels like to fit in, he has to play a bit more like cruise white. And it just I don't think I think he. Over time, he needs to just realize you're a big guy, act like a big guy. You know what's pissing me off? Uh, for a promotion that has done wrestling matches just for the sake of them, they seem intent on pushing this character driven tag team when you have Private Party, Best Friends, uh, Evans and Helico. Luchasaurus and Jungle Boy. It's like, you don't need this act to be at the top of your tag team division. I get why you're doing it, but this is not what you need. You just, like, give me Jungle Boy and Luchasaurus versus best friends for the tag titles, and I think I'll be perfectly fine. <laughs> I'll, I'll give them this. The Dark Order's finishing move is great. Oh, that's great, yeah. Yeah, but also, but, but also the combination stuff that uh, Jungle Boy and Luchasaurus were going to do to try and win the match was also pretty awesome as well. Yeah, I, I, I was a big fan of that. And it struck me as, you know what this actually, this is a good uh, equivalency, I could say. Jungle Boy and Luchasaurus come out, came out of this feeling like stars. And Helico and Evans felt like the equivalent of an NXT tag team that has a lot of indie cred. But at the same time, they're not quite there yet. And yeah, the Dark Order one. came off to me like an indie tag team that people go nuts over for their local thing because it's like, oh, they're kind of like our Undertakers, but that they shouldn't be on the second biggest promotion. I I kind of went along the lines of, of slightly, maybe slightly differently. I thought Jungle Boy Lich Soros, like, if you're going to look at NXT equivalents, they're kind of like the Street Profits where there's just a lot of charisma and just unique talent just there. Uh, and Helico and Jack Evans, like Rob said, is kind of like a TM61, which yeah, is, they, there's a lot, <laughs> there is a lot, of, there is a lot of talent there, but it's just a, a lacking connection with the audience just yet. And the Dark Order seems to me like an AOP, which is a team that most people will hate straight away because they just don't seem to fit the mold and they're not as popular and they seem to be being shoved down our throats. But hopefully over time we'll actually learn to enjoy them and appreciate them for what they are. At least if they can work like AOP, then that would be great. Yeah. But I think that at least this has given me a lot of encouragement about AEW's tag team division. I am more into the tag team division than anything else, I think. I would agree. Adam Page versus Kip Sabian. I have nothing to say about this. I hated this so much. I'm I'm sorry. This did not need to go. One thing I like about AEW is they do have time limits, and I think that's fantastic. This did not need to go the full time limit with Adam Page barely scraping by to beat Kip Sabian. This is another example of, okay, we have all this great talent. We want to showcase how awesome everybody is. No, Adam Page could have done this in eight minutes. He's fighting Chris Jericho. It's imperative that he look like a badass and not barely scrape by a guy who was on the buy-in of your double or nothing show. I have a tendency to agree with that. I think you could have extended it a little bit longer and give Kip Sabian a little bit of shine just based around the fact that Adam Page is working injured. 
because they are telling the story about the leg injury. So if Kip Sabian managed to just get a, a shot in early on that and take over the match for a little while, then I think that's fine. But uh, this should have just been a total showcase for Adam Page from like the first five minutes and then give Kip Sabian a couple of minutes and then the last three or four minutes just all Adam Page just to try and establish him as this is a main event guy. This is a guy who could be, by the end of next month, the, the world champion of AEW. So he shouldn't be it, sh- it shouldn't be that difficult to defeat like rob says a guy who was who obviously takes a lot of pride in the fact that he was the first person to win an AEW match but by proxy that means that he was in the like the opening slot on the card whereas the guy he's facing is going to be the main event of their biggest show today at least at least so yeah he should have won it in more convincing fashion i like I mentioned this on the predictions, but this felt like a mid card thing to me. And you compare this to Kenny Omega and Shima, which one would you think is going to be featuring a guy who's fighting for the world championship next month? The Kenny Omega and Shima match. Yeah. This was uh, like Adam Page and Kip Sabian are fighting because the winner of that is going to win a mid card title more than anything. That's what it felt like to me. Um, before we go into the next match, which was the Leech Brothers match, I want to call attention to another commentary issue I had. They kept going, my God, can you believe that Kenny Omega hasn't won a match, a singles match in AEW? Yes, he's had fucking one. Of course I can <laughs> believe that he hasn't won a singles match. He had one. Let it go. They said it like six times. Uh, obviously we have to talk about the, the post-match when Adam Page did eventually win is Chris Jericho comes out dressed as one of the um, the Dark Order henchmen. Do you think he was actually one of the people that came out with the Dark Order? <laughs> I hope so. Because that would have been, been funny if he was actually just like there and just decided to hold up the pretense afterwards. And I've, again, this, is, this thing that's slight about Coventry, because Coventry, they must know, obviously they know it's Chris Jericho, but they should probably clock in storyline that it's Chris Jericho pretty early on and yet they're just thinking that it's just this Dark Order guy who's attacking Adam Page for some reason until he takes the mask off and reveals it's Chris Jericho Yeah, it's like okay like I know that you want to build up the pretense like uh, when it starts you can say oh we've got this guy from the Dark Order who's just gone into the ring and starts attacking but then you sort of realize hang on that may not be just the guy from the Dark Order or something along those lines just to, you know, make yourself look like you have a bit of common sense. And then he leaves Adam Page bleeding afterwards, and that will lead into Jericho's promo towards the end of the show. Yeah, and let's just <laughs> cut right to that, because I felt like that promo was underwhelming, and then they had Adam Page come out, and they did a little brawl thing, and it still doesn't strike me as being like, wow, man, these two are fighting for the world title. Yeah, I'm going to disagree with you 100%. I think Jericho explained why story actually fucking matters at least. And I can, I can almost agree with you in that it's underwhelming that it's Jericho and I think they're hot shotting page, but at least Jericho explained, I think Adam page is one of the hottest rising stars. And then I started thinking, Oh my God, he might actually beat me. I need to beat him. I need to beat the hangman. Like he hammered everything home to the point where, at least there's story. You know? I I just don't like this thing where there's just this random assortment of matches. I, I agree with Rob in the sense that I think that it was good to add that element of story and I think Jericho's promo did freshen things up and, ex- and put Paige over in a way that maybe he hadn't done in terms of it being in the ring so far. But in a show which has already been going way over time, this promo was way too long. It was meandering. Jericho reinforced too many points the same way he kept talking about uh, Jackoffville or Jerksonville or anything along those lines. Like He could have cut it down by two, three minutes and it still would have had the same effects. The brawl should have looked a lot better than it did. I think it it came across as a little bit sloppy and weak. The, the yeah. meme guy from Fighter Fest, the dude with the red face... <laughs> Tried to fight Jericho, which I thought was funny. Yeah, um, I've I've already equated him. He's AEW's uh, like Big Lisa. Yeah, Tolisa. 
Yeah. <laughs> um, Bald Lisa. <laughs> maybe what they should have done, what, instead of which the Dark Order thing is cool, and I know Jericho likes to do those things, maybe he should have just came out, jumped Paige, cut the promo, Paige gets back up and kicks his ass. Potentially. Oh, we also have to mention, obviously, in the Adam Page Kip Sabian match, that Kip Sabian kissed that guy as well. Did he? Oh my god, who is this guy? Totally missed well, that. Was, yeah. Oh, he was just, um, it was obviously, it's the red face guy. And after Kip Sabian did a move on the outside and was like leaning over the guardrail, that guy decided to just get right in Kip Sabian's face and have a go at him constantly. <laughs> just like shouting abuse at him right, right in his ear. Like he was just, it was about, I don't know, like not even a foot away from him he was just a couple of inches away and so he keeps saying just turns his face and just kisses him on the lips and just carries on wrestling <laughs> <laughs> which i hope like, i hope that obviously um i hope like velvet sky or people like that weren't watching and so they just like they, yeah that's a uh, good <laughs> oh there's sexual oh, harassment now as if i was doing that stuff could have been a very different scenario if you changed yeah. a couple little elements or some things i'm sure nobody's going to complain about it this one though well, no, to be fair, it was the wrestler doing it this time, so... Yeah, but still, I mean, the fan could complain. Yeah. Uh, I have nothing to say about SCU versus Lucha Bros. It was good, but, I mean, that's the same type of match that we've seen a hundred times already, it feels, so that's not, nothing really. But I do have to say something about the post-match stuff, so do you guys have anything about the match itself? I can't say anything, so I fell, asleep, I fell asleep during it. It went on too uh. long. I'll tell you that right now. It went on way too long... Uh, SCU is already the veteran jobber to the stars tag team. I want to start this one off. We sat here on the goddamn preview show and said, what are the young looks going to do it all out? They can't possibly do the Lucha Brothers again. Hmm. But no, we're getting a ladder match, and I love ladder matches, but I'm not concerned about a triple A tag team title match. Well, this is what bugs me. Number one, why is this happening again? Number two, why is it a ladder match when there's supposed to be nothing necessarily on the line? And then they go, oh, because it's for the triple A tag titles. Why the fuck are you doing the triple A tag titles again? Why don't you have your own tag titles yet? Just put them on the line. Just have that. You don't need to do a tournament for this, you know? Well, they've already established the fact they're going to do a tournament for it, so... It's that, but that's, again. like, they should have had this plan for All Out, and they should have figured out something else. They should have made... I don't see any positive thing for why they're highlighting the AAA tag titles. For because this. they have a working relationship with them. It's just stupid to me. I, I don't like that. They, I don't they, like... they plugged Omega being at Triple Mania, and uh, them doing an actual rematch... Of fighter face there i think they're trying to plug this working relationship which yeah, I mean, cody's got a lot to do with yeah and cody's gonna be main event in one of the shows coming up in a six-man tag featuring uh kane velasquez that's fucking in, crazy in his wrestling debut so it's like one of the biggest mma heavyweight stars of all time teaming up with cody rhodes and i can't remember who the other guy they're teaming I think up it's with is it MJF? no it's um it isn't it's the triple a guy uh, but I can't, yeah. remember, I can't remember who it is exactly. Oh. But but if they've got a working relationship, I don't really mind them going for the tag team championships. The bigger issue is the fact that it's the same match. Uh, just to reinforce that, like the match, the show was just dragging at this point. And it's, obviously, it's more difficult for me anyway because it's like yeah, I'm watching time. it at two, three o'clock in the morning. And it's like, so I watch it, I see uh, Christopher Daniels, Frankie Kazarian, Scorpio Sky do their promo at the start of it. And I see the Luch Brothers is a. Uh, like entrance and then the next thing i know they're standing on top of a ladder and just talking to them <laughs> <laughs> it's like i just can't i couldn't tell you anything that happened in this match i don't know how Luke Brothers won i don't know any of the spots that happened it just and i was still on and i was still like it was still going on i managed to wake up right towards the end of it so i must have been like going in and out of it but i just can't recall anything i would have preferred if they just said you know we're the best two in the world and we're standing on a ladder and we want to have an open challenge fucking ladder match for the triple a tag titles and then okay whatever fine you want to do a ladder match there's your ladder match but does it need to be the young bucks i mean yeah they're the best teams you've got in terms of the notoriety but you've already beat that horse to the ground you can't go back to it for a while now maybe you know not like two to three years 
I just, if anybody complains and goes, they've only had one match, like the same thing with listen, the, dude, listen, the revival. Had two shows. Yeah, that's the thing. The revival complained the other day about somebody complaining about seeing the Usos thing over and over again. And they were like, we only had two matches and whatever like that. And it's like, okay, well, they've had three events. And so far there's been Lucha Bros versus Young Bucks, Lucha Bros and somebody versus Young Bucks and somebody. Then a blank time. And then we're going to do that again. So three out of four of these events are going to be Lucha Bros versus Young Bucks. And I get that they're the big stars and all that other kind of stuff. But I would be more interested in this match if it was also SoCal Uncensored and if it was a triple threat. I don't see. I don't like SCU that much. But I, Scorpio I would, Sky is one of the few people that I think like is like a standout guy. I will say that with them doing this match... And obviously, we'll get into that. I think Bucks win the ladder match, and they drop it back at Triple show at Madison Square Garden. But I have no investment in it. Yeah, I'm, I, I don't really care beyond the only things that I don't watch. I don't watch Triple A on a regular basis. Yeah, so I, yeah but I, I know they're that. going to the Garden, and I think AEW in the Garden would be a big deal. So that's why I think that'll happen. I'm sure they'll be on the card in some fashion, whether they are the champions or not. So, I think even though it is like regulation and it's becoming a bit like they like say too regular a thing, you kind of think that because it's a ladder match, that will probably be the blow off. It will still be a very good match because these two teams are two of the best tag teams going right now. So I can't complain too much about it. And as long as it's over with that one, and that's the end of it, and then we're moving on to a tag team tournament where even the Young Bucks or the Lucha Brothers are eliminated fairly early on in the tournament so they can't be competing in the final for it, then that's A-OK with me. That's I feel the like thing, the like... Young Bucks should be slotted into the final. It should be like, listen, the Young Bucks haven't lost a match. They are automatically in the championship match, kind of like Jericho. No, I, kind of think that, I kind of think that's bullshit, really. I mean, if they have this tournament, it's going to have to go on for a little while. So Young Bucks being a part of it, that would be better, I think, than just an automatic. Yeah. But we'll see about how yeah, that works Yeah, but I don't want to see the Young Bucks beat every... They're going to win no. every match. They are the well, Triple H's of this whole thing, so... Well, they kind of... I mean, just face it, like, the team that makes it to the final is going to have to beat, like, three teams to get there. So you can't really avoid that. That's kind of what how tournaments work. I know, but that's why I said, like, oh, well, if you just slot them in the final on merit, you well, that say... makes it look, it makes it look even more bullshit. Like, yeah. is it is it better for them to just beat the teams in front of them, or does it make them look even worse if they just say, oh, we're obviously better than everyone, so we'll just be in the final with the last, essentially the final boss? <laughs> that makes them look even worse. That's true. I, I don't know. I they haven't steered me wrong on tag teams yet, so I will definitely see how this is going um one more dig at the commentary the ladder was black and gold which is the colors of the AEW. alex marvez pointed that out on commentary and jr just goes wow yeah yeah alex wow imagine that i wonder how that happened like just fucking cutting him off at everything he tried to do i just poor guy i think he just looks over to him and says why aren't you the king why is king not here <laughs> like that's what it was feeling like like he just whatever it is they're not clicking so he looks over to him and says like oh why aren't you the king and he looks over to the other guy and it's a guy in a mask and then he just <laughs> seems to question and then he starts questioning why he signed his contract in the first place and then and he's this... like my buddy stone cold uh says this and remember that thing that happened it's a great whatever the, the shield something that's like you know the, this was this led right into the Jericho promo, right? Mm. Because I think this was another moment of Jericho going, oh yeah, we have another thing that I completely forgot about, and yeah. then Jericho's music hits. And it's like, ugh. Okay, Jericho. Well, then that went into Kenny Omega versus Shima, and one question I have, Rob, can you believe that Kenny has not won a singles match before this? And, and you know, <laughs> I, I don't know if you knew this. <laughs> He is he is not won a singles match. Can you believe that? Oh my this god. Was... And this is another one. This was another one. It was so fucking obvious that Kenny Omega was winning. 
that when he hit the V-trigger, I said, well, you can beat him with that. The V-trigger's not a, a bad move. We just saw uh, Ben Askren get his fucking head knocked off with a knee. Why can't you beat somebody with a knee? But no, it had to get dragged out because, yet again, you have to drag everything out. Mm, I don't like that. It needs to be a 20-something minute thing that uh, both guys look like they're completely equals and all that. And I caught myself again in the first couple minutes of this. I caught myself not paying attention. And I'm like, I'm not purposely doing this with, with Shima's matches, but it just keeps happening. And then I forced myself to not work on stuff and to watch the match. And it was good. Like, it's exactly the type of match that, like, it's already happened. It's not been more than an hour. And I don't remember anything from the match. That's my big criticism about everything with AEW. It's like, yeah, it was good, but I don't remember anything about it. And I know Shima hit a bunch of meteoras, like in succession. Yep. He hit like I, five. I, I never, I never thought that'd be a, ma- a move that I'd ever see overdone in a match before. <laughs> it's like, yeah, like hit a dozen meteoras in one match. And it's, Omega, yeah. I didn't see as many V triggers as I normally do, but Omega typically hits like a dozen V triggers. But this is a fine match. I haven't been blown away by Kenny Omega this year, which sucks, which I'm hoping he changes with Moxley. But I haven't had the best bout machine this year. I, Omega wins I think that. Um, oh yeah, Omega wins the match. It's just a case of like I think if this had been only one of the matches that had gone this long then it I, it would have been fine. It would have felt more special. But it's just the fact that so many matches went over 15 minutes that it doesn't feel that great that one goes over 20 and it's just... I don't think like a first encounter between two people that have never wrestled before should go this long or feel this epic. And it's worth it because like, like, sometimes you do try and build up the first match and make it good, but usually by this point where everyone's carrying each other's moves and you have to beat them with the best one, that should really be like the third match in a series, at least the second, than... or at least yeah. on a bigger event, or at least for something, or you yeah, know. yeah, something, yeah, something like that. It's just a case of like this is just two guys in there wrestling before, and like, like you said, this this match wasn't bad by any stretch of the imagination. It was a very good match. It just felt like just shave five, ten minutes off of it, and then it's it could be even better. Mm-hmm. Uh, the the crowd was is not the worst thing. Yeah, but the, well, that was uh, that wasn't even the name of the pay per view. It was Fight for the Fallen. Oh Jesus! <laughs> they, yeah, they can't fight forever anymore. Um, no, but My the reason I bring that. that up is because I got the same vibes that we've talked about with the uh, Fighter Fest women's match, where yeah. I was not into this match. I'm sorry, love Kenny Omega. I did not feel this match at all. It was just another match to me. And maybe that's more of a statement on the state of wrestling in 2019, but it just felt average. And I don't know. I'm really excited for that Moxley match. It was average good. It was the type of thing where it's like, I mean, I think I put this in my one review, but it's like, it was good. And if anybody goes like, oh my gosh, this is the best thing ever. No. But then just because I don't think it's the best thing ever doesn't mean I think that it's some fucking awful, horrendous match. It's just like, yeah, it was good. Like, uh, I like and, butter and noodles. And... Butter noodles are good. It's not a fucking five-course <laughs> meal. Like, you know what I mean? It's the type of thing that, yeah, it does, does the trick. Like, on, and the, and if you I... just showed me this match out of the blue on a regular night just on its own, I'd be like, yeah, it's a good match. And then I'd forget about it again. Like, I, th- I think it's the idea of, like, if the audience in the building is charting very he- highly for it and saying, like, like say, the Fight Forever chance or this is awesome, then it's done its job. And yeah. maybe maybe we're just not the audience for this type of match. And the audience that turned up to watch the show, that was there. That was their type of match. And that's the people they're trying to appeal to the most, I guess. That's another thing that I had put in there. I said this is exactly the type of match that people that love elite wrestling are looking for. So they gave them what they wanted. But yeah. I'll fully admit, I am not 100% their target audience because part of me is just so fucking burnt out from all this wrestling. And it's a job for me in some days. 
So I am not exactly what they're looking for because I would have potentially a different viewpoint if I could just watch these and not have to do live coverage for three things at the same time and different and like, you know, pinpoint all these little elements and break it apart and do all this kind of discussion and all other kind of stuff. If I didn't have to do that, I probably would enjoy everything a little bit more. Or in some cases, I just wouldn't watch it. Like I caught myself watching NXT UK this last week and I was like, you know what? I would not watch this if I didn't have to. It just wasn't something that was interesting to me. And I ended up skipping most of the matches. So if it was something like this, if you said you're going to have like every match is going to be Kenny Omega and Shima, I probably wouldn't watch it in the future because I'd be like, yeah, they're all good. But, you know, a little bit of variety every once in a while. And that's something that I kind of liked about the Young Bucks versus Cody Rhodes and Dustin Rhodes. It was a little bit of variety because they weren't just doing all the flippy stuff, but it did go on too long. And Mm -hmm. I think it's a little bit funny that the young bucks haven't lost a single match and that they've man evented a lot and stuff like that but i don't think that that was necessarily the right way to go kind of depending on certain things but i'm okay with it too so i'm not really like crapping on it for that i will crap on some other stuff that happens later but match wise itself what do you guys think thought it was a fine match i'm to address the young bucks winning for now i'm fine with that they are the best tag team they can do that for now. It's clear when you have a Jericho or a Cody or a Dustin, storytelling helps so much and it makes things more fun. And even the Bucks are better when they tell stories and they're making fun of Dustin and Cody and they're like, I need my older brother. And they're, you know, Dustin is looking for the hot tag and Nick knocks Cody off the ropes and gets on Cody's side of the ring and goes, Dustin, tag me in. And they're laughing at him. I, That stuff is fun to me. Like, that version of pro wrestling is fun to me. I, you know, I've already mentioned JR being annoyed with the lack of rules, which hurt the match to some degree. But I think they had a lot of fun. I had a lot of fun watching it. And Callum? Uh... Yeah, it was it was one of the better matches on the show. Like I'd say, it's like it's good to have some sort of storytelling elements to it. I think again, shave five minutes off of it, it still goes on too long. It's I wouldn't say with the young bucks winning all the time. I think it's fine if it's like in a tag team setting, in the sense that they should win this match because the other two haven't teamed up in many years. So if they had lost it, then it makes the young bucks look. Like, they're not the well oiled machine. Like, they can lose matches to people like the Lucha Brothers or teams that are more regularly teaming together, whereas it's two guys and one of them is in his 50s. So if Young Bucks had lost that, there would have been a bit more question marks over it because then you'd have to say, oh, well, Cody and Dustin have got to team up regularly now. They've got to enter the tag team tournament. They've got to potentially win the tag team tournament. And if Dustin's not going to wrestle that much anymore, then they obviously can't do that. Uh, It was good to have a few story tournaments storytelling elements i don't think it needed two hot tags where it's first the the uh like cody gets the hot tag and then they do put the heat on matt jackson and then he gets the hot tag to nick jackson i think you just decide which one of you is the heel and just stick with it nope because this is all elite wrestling and there ain't no baby faces or heels uh in regards to like the main event thing i mean they've had three shows and the young bucks have main evented one of them so don't really see that coming into it just yet because they're not going to main event all out. And, yeah, we know Jericho's main eventing that. Yeah, they didn't main event double or nothing. They're obviously high up the card, but they kind of should be because they're one of the biggest draws to AEW. It's it's one of the things like obviously people say, yeah, they are pushing themselves and they're the vice president, so they're giving themselves a lot of power. But let's face it, these guys were the ones that sold out Madison Square Garden. And they weren't even on the on card. A, yeah, and they weren't on the card for it. They're, these guys are the draws to AEW. Without them, AEW doesn't exist, and there's not a secondary... There's not any sort of alternative to WWE without Cody, Kenny, and the Young Bugs. So of course, they're going to be in the higher positions. They're the reason why people actually pay to watch AEW. I'm glad you said alternative to WWE. Yeah, not I don't compared know. to... Yeah, not I don't compared. know if... Uh, Tony, I don't know if you want to jump in here, but I want to discuss the things that happened following the yeah 
So okay. they young decided Bucks to cut this promo, and the Young Bucks are basically saying, you guys are great, you're one of the best tag teams ever, and all this, because you got to put people over and whatever. And then it's this awkward transition where people start coming out, and they're like, well, I guess we're running short on time, and all this, or whatever. And that was just a very awkward transition. And then they bring out this big check, $150,000. Cody Rhodes gives this speech about, you know, it's essentially like, we wanted to do this for charity and whatever. Also, fuck WWE in a lot of different ways. And if they would have left it at that, I don't think it would have like thrown me off. But then they dragged this out for like another like four minutes. It felt like maybe it wasn't that long, but it felt like it. Can I cut where they're in here? like, what's that? Can I cut in here or go for it? Because they they repeat the phrase several times. Well, we're not on the air, and I'm thinking, do they yeah, really, are. <laughs> are they really not fucking aware that they're still streaming live? Like, it just seemed like, well, we're not on the air, so we're just going to, you know, jerk around. And Cody says, I, I don't think we're on the air, so, you know, you can't counter-program the AEW. And I thought, okay, he knows he's on the air. That's just one thing that they're going to let fly. But no, then again... Kenny, well, I don't want to say goodbye and goodnight, bang, because that seems insensitive because we're doing a show against gun violence. Smart call. But we're not on the air. But yes, you are. <laughs> so I'm going to say, instead of bang, I'm going to say boing, because nobody ever got hurt just bouncing around. And I'm like, what the fuck is this? <laughs> there was little to no point to all of this. And... There was a couple of shots thrown in at WWE. Matt Jackson had to get in the, well, you guys are great, and we're sorry that we didn't know, but we don't watch that company, and I'm just begging you to stop doing that. Please. It's just annoying. It makes you seem Bush League because you're calling out for attention in the same way that, and I'll admit it, WWE purposely counter-programmed the show because I watched some of that show, and yeah... It was like they perfectly divided the audience, even though I think most stuck with AEW tonight. And one last shot at Jim Ross. Dustin, who must have been really hot, unzips the top of his outfit. And JR's propensity for telling a story says, oh, what's the symbolism there? There's so many stories to tell here. Two seconds after that, leaves JR's tongue. Just Dustin zip back up the outfit. And I'm like, ugh, this poor old man. <laughs> I think with the charity stuff, you talk about obviously taking the shot at WWE and whether or not they deserve that shot or not is obviously there's the argument that they shouldn't be referencing WWE regardless because it makes them seem like they're obviously the second place competition, but Frankly, they are second place, and they should know the fact that they're second place. And taking a shot for them for something that can make WWE seem more of an enemy, I think if you've got the opportunity, you should take it. Because at the end of the day, it's competition, and WWE did fire the shot by putting the show on at the same time. Whether you agree that they should do it or not, in spirit of competition, in spirit of competition, that's all fair game, but also in spirit of competition, AEW should have the right to say that they're a bunch of assholes for doing it. And if they did believe they were off on the air, which I highly doubt that they did, I believe that they knew that they were on the air for the entirety of that thing mm-hmm. and decided to just play it up with it because they have a very deliberate sense of humour, which if you like and you like being the elite and all the stuff like that, then you will find hilarious. If you don't watch that stuff or you don't find that kind of humour hilarious, then it's going to turn you off very quickly. Um. But at the end of the day, they raised $150,000 for charity, so can't really complain too much about it. Yeah, no complaints of the fact that they did a charity thing. That's obviously really good. My complaint was just, I wanted this to fucking end, and I was just like, oh, yeah. just knock this off? Like, I don't need this, you know? Yeah, that, that's and if you wanted idea. to pat yourselves on the back about the charity thing, you could have been like, all right, well, this was all for charity. We raised $150,000. Thank you all for coming out. Not this, like... How about we do a boing instead of a this? But if I if we say this, then we and it's just like oh shut the fuck up and just move on. Like you know, like I know it's not their fault that I've got other crap to do. But at the same time, I'm like this event went on too long. Wrap it up. 
it's a it's yeah. 1158 like you know and also they genuinely were like praising dustin and cody and it seemed like there was going to be a payoff there and they just cut themselves off they legit thought like yeah. oh well we're done here you, and, you rushed the part that shouldn't have been rushed and dragged your ass on the part that should have not been going on as long and had i been at the live show i would have came home like oh guys they did this funny thing off air where kenny said boing instead of bang because i would have believed that they were off air because they said it enough times Hmm. well there's your hour there's your review that's what we thought about fight for the fallen i'm still obviously in for all out and i hope that it's the best show that they've done so far i still have my problems I'm still going to try to keep things going. It's not like AEW is awful, but I'm still going to crap on the things that I want to crap on. Just the same as I did with WWE, because that's fair is fair. And you got to keep up the same, uh, toe the same company line. You know what I mean? And we'll be doing plenty of that tomorrow. Or at least you guys will be. More than likely. Yeah, because Extreme <laughs> yeah. Rules is coming up tomorrow. So stay tuned for that, everybody. As I mentioned before, I'm going to try to... Now it's... One thirty in the morning, and I have to start the Evolve show, but uh, no post-show coming immediately for that. That's going to be on the hot tags following the post-show of Extreme Rules. And next week, we will also break down the sexiest WWE Superstars tournament with the finals. Go ahead and vote while you can. I'm not sure when I'm shutting the poll off, but it's either going to happen before Extreme Rules or before Monday Night Raw, depending on if I have the time to shut it off before Extreme Rules. I'm not going to be doing that during Extreme Rules because that's just way too much effort to do and stuff, but... I don't know. That's uh, there's a lot of work to get done and not a whole lot of time. <laughs> uh, we did all of our plugs for the most part, but really quickly, just uh, stay tuned to those kind of things that we had said before, as well as 2001 a space, a space Odyssey. 2001 a Wrestling Odyssey <laughs> is going to be coming up pretty soon, probably next week, maybe the week afterward. And uh, yeah, anything else you guys want to talk about? Um, um, donate to the Patreon. You know, uh, check out all the weeklies at smartguymoment.com. Follow us at our earlier mentioned Twitters. And Callum, do you have anything else? No, just the 2001, which Tony's already said. It probably will be the last week of the month, as it usually is. Just because I'm still collecting information for it. So it will take a little while to build up. But yeah, it's, it's coming in at the end of the month. and. When you follow us on Twitter, you could probably check out my ramblings of uh, New Japan because it doesn't end for me today because I'll go from this and New Japan starts in less than an hour. So, yay. Oh, no, <laughs> they're not doing it at 2.30 tonight, are they? Yeah, it's 6 oh, a.m. that's awful, Or 7 a.m. They're going to do it right now. Tony, we got to go. We're gonna... <laughs> <laughs> we got to go. All right, everybody. Thank you for listening to this. Thank you for all your support. Thank you for your comments below if you've done that already. We will see you in the Extreme Rules breakdown tomorrow night, whenever you're listening to this. I don't know. Maybe you're listening from two years now. now. Blah, blah, blah. That's it. This has been another Smart Cat moment, and we're being counted out.